Good evening, and welcome to the first ever YOLO Community Care Continuum Virtual Gala. This is not the way we would have chosen to be with you tonight, but we are excited and hopeful for what this evening could be. My name is Michelle Kellogg, and I'm the Executive Director of YOLO Community Care Continuum. I have been with the agency for over 23 years. I believe in our programs and what their existence has meant to our communities for mental health treatment. Let me tell you about YCCC. YOLO Community Care Continuum has been providing community-based mental health support services for over 40 years. Prior to 1979, institutes of mental disease were the only form of treatment for individuals suffering with mental health diagnoses. Community members in Yolo County viewed this as unacceptable and had a vision that things could be different. Yolo County family members, led by Bill and Pat Williams, pooled their resources and purchased an older style ranch house surrounded by 10 acres of farmland. This setting was used to establish one of the first of its kind 18 month treatment programs designed to assist seriously mentally ill individuals make the transition from locked psychiatric facilities into housing in the community. Since those early days, YCCC has not only expanded our programs and services, but has also expanded the size and diversity of the population we serve in response to the community's needs. The philosophy of our founders is still reflected in the agency's mission to better the lives of people with a mental illness through direct services, advocacy, education, and volunteer efforts. To meet this mission, YCCC manages six different programs offering compassionate, innovative, direct services to individual clients. Each component of our service continuum is designed to meet each client's needs at specific points in the recovery process. Our programs provide a continuum of services, including crisis residential treatment, rehabilitative residential treatment, medical respite, supportive housing, and support and referral for mentally ill, duly diagnosed, and homeless clients. In addition to providing direct services, our agency is actively involved in advocacy, education, and volunteer efforts on behalf of persons with a mental illness by addressing their health, social, emotional, economic, and vocational needs in their communities. Our agency serves over 700 adult clients annually through our residential and outpatient programs. Each of our programs reflects our value of consumer-driven services that deliver positive outcomes for our clients' lives. Tonight, we will tell you about each of these programs in our continuum present an inspirational story about hope and connection, and hopefully offer you a laugh or two in these heavy times. Now, I want to introduce you to Stephen Dilbert from the Impact Foundry. He is graciously offered to be our MC for the evening, and we are very grateful to him. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Oh, hello there. I didn't see you come in. Could be because your camera's off. It's all right. I was just doing a bit of light reading. I'm Stephen Dilbert, your five-star Yelp-reviewed guide to virtual galas. Welcome to the YOLO Community Care Continuums, an evening of inspiration and hope. Do you know what inspires me? A nice cocktail. If only we had someone that could teach us how to make a great cocktail. What's that? Oh, Jonathan Howard's here. Jonathan Howard, vice president of the YCCC. He heads the external committee. He's been on the board for three years and he works for the California Department of Education. He's the very same Jonathan who advocates for children, teachers, and schools that make up the state's education system before the state legis legislature. Wow, that's a lot of stuff. 
Annie can make a great cocktail? Fabulous. When do we begin? Oh, I guess now. Enjoy. Hello, my name's Jonathan Howard. I'm the current vice president for YCCC. Michelle asked me to put together a little something for tonight's event. And so I thought it would be nice that if together as a community, we could make cocktails. So um, hopefully you all have the ingredients and supply list that was sent out. Why don't you go ahead and grab those things and we'll get started. This evening, we're going to be making a lemon drop. This cocktail is a California native. It was created by Norman J. Hobday in the 1970s in San Francisco. For this cocktail, you're going to need a cocktail glass. Just go ahead and put it in the freezer. A shaker of some sort. Three fourths ounces of simple syrup. If you don't have simple syrup, you can use maple syrup, that's fine. Three fourths ounces of lemon juice, fresh please if you have it and two ounces of vodka. Start by putting the lemon juice into the shaker. Next, we're going to want our simple syrup. Again, if you don't have simple syrup, it's okay to use maple syrup, three fourth ounces there. And then that also can go right into the shaker. Next up is your vodka. I'm using a local Sacramento brand. So if you have that, that's nice too. Put that right in. Now that we have all of our ingredients in the shaker, we wanna add our ice. Three or four cubes is enough. If you have very large cubes, you can just use two. Once you have the ice cubes in your shaker, go ahead and close it up tight and then start to shake. And what you're gonna to wanna to do here a shake for 15 to 20 seconds. It seems like a long time, and it is, but that's okay. What we're trying to dilute is to break up the ice a little and dilute the vodka. Once you're done shaking, go ahead and pop that open. Get your strainer, and then go ahead and pull your uh, cocktail glass out of the freezer where it's been chilling. Go ahead and pour that right on in. Now this cocktail doesn't require a garnish, but if you wanted one, you can use the lemon peel from the lemons you squeezed earlier and go ahead and just squeeze it a little and run it along the rim and drop it right on in. And there you have it, the lemon drop. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you for caring. Thank you for giving. Without your support, YCCC would not be here. Cheers. Howdy, y'all. Quite a yarn there that Jonathan Spurn heard it. We appreciate you, John. Now that our thirst is quenched and I'm no longer feeling this parched, I think it's time we move on over to Tim Muir as he tells us all about Safe Harbor and Leon as she talks about the farmhouse. Now, Tim Muir, now if you don't know him, reckon he's been here as long as Jonathan on the board, and uh, he in charge all the monopoly money that's hidden under the farm. Uh, so he probably got a lot of two dollar words and city folk stuff to tell us about but uh i got a lot of fixing up to do so why don't y'all head on over and learn something hi i am leo abbott proud to be the president of the y triple c board of dedicated members i i moved to yolo county to work for county mental health i was delighted to learn about the continuum of care between YCCC and the county. It is what I had worked to establish before coming here. I was new to the area, so I was not familiar with the county roads. I needed to get to the farmhouse, and the only way I knew was to take a particular county road, make a left at the sunflowers, and then I would be there. Well, when they harvested the fun sunflowers, I was totally lost. As clinical consultant to YCCC, I personally witnessed the difference YCCC made in the lives of many people. I want to tell you about our flagship program, The Farmhouse. The Farmhouse was the first program established in 1979. 
Yolo Community Care Continuum was founded when a small group of concerned parents gathered to resolve a dilemma they shared. Each of the parents had young adult children who had been diagnosed with mental illness too severe to be cared for at home. <clears throat> they believed it would be beneficial to their children if they could live close by in a community setting while receiving the professional support necessary to avoid hospitalization. These parents decided to create a place that felt like home, where the children could get the professional treatment and compassionate support they needed to live as productive lives as possible. One couple donated a house and Yolo Community Care Continuum was born. Their vision has become a statewide model of mental health care. Today, the farmhouse runs on the 10 acre parcel where it all began. While at the farmhouse, residents learn independent living skills such as cooking, shopping, and money management, and learn strategies for managing their mental health. They pursue educational goals, which may have been interrupted by the onset of their illness. Residents raise livestock and maintain a small plot of land for growing vegetables. This teaches them vocational skills that residents later apply to jobs they may assume after graduating from the farmhouse. The farmhouse is the first program in the continuum of mental health services offered by YCCC. It has provided hope and freedom for thousands of individuals who would otherwise be living in locked facilities. This program is near and dear to my heart. I believe in the ways that YCCC embodies the ideals of social rehabilitation and how this philosophy has created recovery possibilities in our community. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Timur Mamadov and I'm a treasurer at YCCC. Before joining the board, I was a line staff worker at Safe Harbor for almost two years. Safe Harbor Crisis House serves adults experiencing an acute phase of mental illness. The short-term residential program provides psychiatric and social services in a compassionate home-like environment. Typically, clients stay between 3 and 30 days and return to their homes in the community once stabilized. Other YCCC programs support clients after they leave Safe Harbor. Clients get the medical and psychiatric care, counseling and advocacy services necessary to stabilize their conditions. They learn to manage their illness in order to return to their homes in the community. Safe Harbor serves as an alternative to and is a step down from psychiatric hospitalization. Once symptoms of crisis are stabilized, service and support are arranged upon discharge to help the client maintain the level of mental health achieved during their stay at Safe Harbor. Within Yolo County, it is the only alternative to involuntary hospitalization. I have personally witnessed how Safe Harbor saves lives. This program gives hope to individuals at some of the darkest points in their lives. The caring and support that staff provide reminds clients that their life matters and things can be better. Thank you. Hey everybody, I hope you're having a great time. Uh, I just wanted to introduce myself not in character for once. So Stephen Dobert, I work at the Impact Foundry. Uh, my role is I man manage the membership here and uh, my title is Relationship Builder. And I, I truly believe that it is about building relationships. It's how we make powerful connections and impact in our community. And I wanted to take this time to introduce our speaker, our keynote speaker for the night. His name is Mr. David Woods Bartley. Uh, he is a speaker, he is a trainer, he is a writer. He's an absolute joy to listen to as he tells you about how connection really helped save his life. And he believes in creating a mental health journey that takes you from mental illness to mental wellness. So with that, I'd like to introduce Mr. David Woods Bartley telling us a very impactful story. And we greatly appreciate that he is here tonight to uh, share that with us. Thank you. So recently, as of last Monday, I celebrated an interesting anniversary. It was my ninth anniversary. Now, it wasn't a wedding anniversary. It wasn't a birthday. It, it wasn't something that you might expect. 
but yet it was an incredibly important day, and most anniversaries are that. This was the ninth anniversary of the day that I was going to kill myself. August 31st, 2011, nine years ago, was indeed that day. And that was the day that the monster known as clinical depression had finally, after trying passionately for close to 40 years, convinced me of a slate of dark and awful lies. On that day, the monster convinced me, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that I was worthless and useless, that I was a piece of garbage, that I was ugly and stupid and pitiful, that I was literally grotesque. And I believe those lies, they became truths to me. While all be it illogical, I truly felt that that was the truth. And I remember very clearly waking up on that day. I was living about 30 minutes east of Sacramento in a little hamlet of what I call Penryn. And I remember going outside. We lived on this beautiful two and a half acre parcel. I remember going outside and looking at the sky. And it was like a Michelangelo rendition. It was so stunning and beautiful. And I walked around our property, and it was almost like my mind was taking snapshots. And then I went back inside, sat down at the computer, and I typed out my suicide note. And then without telling anybody where I was headed, I made the short 20-minute drive from our home in Penryn to the Forest Hill Bridge. Now, for those of you who don't know, know, the Forest Hill Bridge stands 730 feet above the North Fork of the American River. It is 500 feet further off the ground than its more famous cousin in San Francisco. And there's an important note because this was not my first time to the bridge, and it brings up an even more important thought that suicide is almost never spontaneous. I had been plagued by suicidal ideations for close to 40 years, and I had planned this, I had imagined it, but this was the day that I thought that what I was about to do was selfless, not selfish. And that may seem contrary, but when you feel in that acute space that everybody in your life would be better off without you, you feel that you are, again, illogical, you are giving people a gift. And so I parked my vehicle in the spot that I already knew where I would park it. Brought the vehicle to a rest, turned off the ignition, closed my eyes, and put my hands reflexively at the 10 and 2 position on the steering wheel. Took a deep breath, opened them quickly, leaned over, grabbed the suicide note that I had typed out, placed that on the center of the dash, took the keys out of the ignition, placed those on the center of the note, exited the vehicle, and then turned around just to make sure I'd left the door unlocked. Reverse facing, crossed over the road, and then come to the shortest, the closest end of the bridge. Now the bridge is basically a half a mile long. The view, if you've not seen it, is spectacular, but I was singularly focused on the light post that was 1,000 feet away. I didn't want to look at the view. I didn't want to make eye contact with the drivers passing by. I wanted to focus, lest I be dissuaded, focused on that light post. And step by step, slowly but surely, I made my way to the midpoint, turning to my left without looking up bent over, the suicide barrier hitting me right across the chest, and I focused on the river. And my mind had picked out this spot, this dark piece of water. And I became so fixated that everything else went away. I, I was trying to imagine what's the quickest and the easiest way over the rail. I tried to imagine what is it going to feel like to drop 700 feet. And I'd done the calculation. It was going to take me seven and a half seconds. And then I imagined and actually set out an audible prayer that I would either pass out or pass away before I made impact. I don't know how long I stayed there. I became so fixated, but thankfully it was long enough for a passing driver to look upon this scene and think something's not right with this picture. And then she acted on it. She picked up the phone and called 911 and a first responder approached me from the left-hand side and initially established contact which is logistical. And then this extraordinary human being created connection, which is life-saving because connection creates hope, and hope saves lives. I was taken off the bridge to the emergency room in Roseville at Sutter, and then to the psychiatric health facility. They call it the Puff in Kirby Hills down in Roseville. And when people found out I was there and why, they could not wrap their head around it. It made no sense who they knew me to be was different than I, who I knew myself to be. And I would be the last person they would think would want to kill themselves, the last person to think that they were worthless. Because instead of seeing me 
as clinically depressed or suicidal. People saw me as the happy and contented co-director of a large nationally recognized animal sanctuary called A Chance for Bliss. And the sanctuary was an amazing place, home to as many as 100 animals at any one time. 25 horses, 23 dogs, nine pot-bellied pigs, goats and sheep and ducks and geese and bunnies and birds, this whole plethora. If Noah were alive today, he'd be jealous. It was an incredible place, and for animals to come to the sanctuary that my former bride, Deanna, and I ran for a great many years, they had to fit into four categories, one of four. They had to be very old, very sick, have some sort of special need, or the vast majority were at the end of life. We were very much like a large hospice. And so we did no adoptions. Animal, animals came, and they became a resident and stayed until we like to say they made their transition. And so we became known throughout the country, even different parts of the world, as a forever home for unadoptable companion animals. And on June 2nd, 2010, we were the cover story in the life section of USA Today. I didn't fit the image of somebody who was mentally ill. I didn't fit the image of somebody who was clinically depressed. I didn't fit the image of somebody who was a high risk for suicide. But the truth is, please hear me when I say, sometimes what hurts the most can't be seen. Sometimes great despair and soul-wrenching, soul-killing, soul-emptying agony lies just behind a forced smile, a distracting joke, or in this case, a seemingly perfect and ideal life. And because of that, not even my former beloved had no idea the degree to which I was suffering. I was a great actor. I hid behind the velocity of running the sanctuary. And just 14 short months after the mountaintop experience of being in USA Today, there I was on a dark spot on a tall, tall bridge, one swift movement to ending my life. But my life was saved. And on a day I thought would be my last day alive, it was instead the first day of a brand new life. And the first steps in what has now been a nine year journey away from mental illness and into the experience of our birthright, mental wellness, mental health. Now, I would love to tell you that over these last nine years, it has been nothing but a straight and smooth and level path from point A to point B where I stand now, but that'd be a lie. I would love to tell you I've never had a severely clinically depressed episode. That would be a lie. I would love to tell you that I've never had a thought about killing myself, but that would be a lie. The road has, in fact, been up and down and straight and smooth and, and bumpy. There have been rapid descents and steep ascents. There have been sheer drop-offs. But that's just the way that it is. But I'm able to keep going. I know what to do because there has also been these grand vistas, these views that I never thought possible, these roadside stands that serve up these small bottles of mental health, this sweet ne nectar, the like of which I never thought possible. And what I've learned over these nine years is critically important. I first learned that I didn't choose depression. I didn't choose suicidal ideations. Mine was born out of the difficult confluence of genetics, inheriting the genetics of my grandfather who ended his life by suicide and my severely clinically depressed father. And added in that swirling mix was the horror at 11 of being twice raped by a Boy Scout leader. And when I learned what the genesis of my condition was, I also understood and these words came out of the mouth on the second day by an amazing psychiatrist when I was in the psych ward in which he told me, David, it's not your fault. And those things together allowed me then to become receptive and open to learning. And the most important thing that I've learned over these years is that I must care for the whole of who I am. The, the monster is not satisfied with just raping my mind. The monster wants to own my body. The monster wants to empty my soul. And so I must care for the whole of who I am, whole person care, body, mind, and spirit. And so with the great support and help of others, I have put my self-care high upon a pedestal. There is nothing more important. It is the least selfish thing I can do. If my cup is full, I can help quench the thirst of somebody who is suffering. So it's all about sleep and diet and exercise, about therapy and support groups and medication and psychiatry. It's all about my own spiritual practice and then a, de a defined purpose. This, that the sanctuary no longer operates, but I use stories from the sanctuary to try to make this subject of mental health and mental illness and suicide a little bit more approachable. But of everything that I do, without a doubt, the single most important thing is connection. 
The three most important words in mental health are connection, connection, connection. Connection is the currency of wellness. There is no way that we can be well unless we connect. We must do this. And let me explain it this way, that we have this paradigm of mental illness, these different horrific maladies, and I want to speak about depression. And to call depression a mental illness is too general. Depression is, at its heart, a, a disease of, of self-loathing, of self-criticism, of self-hatred. It is, in fact, a, de, a thought disorder, because the sequence works like this. Dark, awful thoughts lead to overwhelming emotions, which can trigger harmful actions. Sometimes that sequence is simultaneous and instantaneous. Sometimes it builds over a course of weeks or months or years. But that's the way it works for somebody like myself. And so connection breaks that circuit. Connection is taking that pair of pliers and diffusing a bomb. Because our minds cannot hold competitive thoughts. I can't think about living and dying in the space of being connected. I can only think about living. And so the conscious creation of connection for me is the single most important thing I can do to move the vehicle of my self-care on to the place of wellness, to navigate this still often difficult road. And that's what we can do for one another because the beautiful thing about connection is lies in its pure reciprocity. What is good for me is ultimately good for you. It is the never-ending circle of giving and receiving. And there's simple ways that we can create connection because the truth is we all need it no matter what. We can become great with names. We can begin to practice that because there's going to be a day when you remember somebody's name, when they have no expectation that you will, and that can simply be a life-saving effort. You can leverage curiosity to create the fertile, smooth ground of understanding because actions that we see oftentimes make no sense. I'm sure the first responder came up to me thinking silently, what's a nice guy like that doing on a bridge like this? But the first question out of his mouth after the establishment of safety was, David, what does it feel like to be depressed? A counterintuitive question that didn't push me over the edge, but in fact pulled me back from it. And then we need to let people know how we feel. We could tell somebody we love them yesterday, but that doesn't mean they don't need it today. We can send a, a timely and specific, authentic expression by text, by email. We can make a phone call. We can do it in person. But I think that the, the greatest way, the most effective way is the good old-fashioned handwritten note. Take the time to sit down. Do it now because you won't do it tomorrow. And, and be heartfelt. Offer support, not advice. Give empathy, not pity. Ooze that note. Let it drip with understanding and not judgment. And one of the greatest that I ever received at the end of the note, this daughter of mine, named Natalie, who's not mine by biology, but more by connection, she told me in no uncertain terms after she knew that sometimes what hurts David the most can't be seen, but sometimes what helps David the most is easy to do. She told me at the end of that note, depression can't have you because you're ours. It's all about connection. And this place, the farmhouse, is all about connection. This place is indeed worth your time. This place is deserving of your talent. This place needs your treasure. This place doesn't operate just by the altruistic motivation of the staff and the clients and those who have moved on. It needs your funds, it needs money. And you could not invest, you could not give money to a better place in the farmhouse. I would ask you please to consider a donation as we enjoy this extraordinary night. And let me finish with one more story. Because the truth is this matter of suicide is become critical. Especially now in COVID-19, people because of forced isolation and social distancing are in the horrific place of isolation. Nothing good comes out of isolation. Isolation is distinct from solitude. One is a choice, one is not. And the problem and the solution is best put in the words of the great Dr. Drew Ramsey, who's a psychiatrist, and he says this, someone you see today is thinking about killing themselves. Your smile, your question, your love could save them. Trust me, they told me it did. I know that the farmhouse will continue to serve souls in need, souls like me. And because of that, I know we will win the day and our story will be just like Odie's story. 
Odie was a 35-year-old chocolate-colored Tennessee walker. He was this gated horse. And a Tennessee walker is the sort of horse that's out in front of those incredible civic parades. He was proud and strong in his heyday. There was no greater horse. But when Odie came to the sanctuary, he was emaciated, he was depressed, he was lonely, he was isolated, and he was ailing with this bad right-hand hip, which caused him to list to the right-hand side. But like the people who come to the farmhouse, as soon as Odie's hooves hit the sanctuary soil, he began a slow yet steady, measurable progression from hopelessness to hopefulness. Now, like we humans, all horses want to have a job. And while we didn't have a want, a, a, a posted open job list, <laughs> Odie went ahead and assumed the position of the town crier. Twice a day, morning and the evening, Odie would be the first animal at the gate. And when the other animals, the other farm animals, saw the grand old man in front and center position, they knew, knew it was time to form ranks behind their leader and make their way from the front pasture to the rear, where they would spend the day luxuriating, and then reverse course in the evening and come back from the back pasture to the front. Well, one day there's Odie, front and center position, somewhat impatient. I open the gate, and then I watch Odie lead his posse across. Now, it's interesting to note, even though he was slow and the line was never straight. They never went in front of them. They were very patient. They didn't want to disrespect their leader. Went behind Odie, shut the gate, and then go do what I do best is pick up manure. A couple hours later, I have that feeling that we've all had, the feeling like something's not right, and I spin around, and there to my horror, Odie is down on his bad right-hand hip on the edge of this big, beautiful pond that we had. Then I watch as Odie attempts to stand up into my added horror, he loses his balance and falls into the pond and I think, oh my God, Odie's too weak. He, he's not gonna be able to swim. He's gonna drown in this pond. And so I rush back up, I come right to the edge and then my heart actually relaxed a little bit because I thought, well, the water's buoyant. Odie will be able to stand. But over the next several hours, I watch as my magnificent horse attempted to stand only to fall back attempt to stand and only to fall back, and again and again, and I could get a clear sense that his hope was beginning to fade. Now, Dee and I were all about the quality of an animal's experience, not the length of time, and I realized on that terrible day, I had to make the most difficult decision of all. I needed to help Odie move on to the greenest pasture of all. So I went inside and had a long talk with her veterinarian, and we came up with a way to euthanize Odie in the pond and then retrieve his body later. By the time I got back, it was late in the day. It was evening. It was time for the animals to make their journey from the back pasture to the front. But it wasn't Odie standing in the primary position. It was his best friend in all the world. It was Prince, this beautiful former racing horse that had been discarded. He was brilliant and he was caramel colored with a white blaze on his forewalk and it looked like his four feet had been dipped in white paint. Odie and he were Thick as thieves, they were BFS, they were always together. And here, Odie, head above water, just barely, here was Prince honoring his best friend, taking up the position that Odie normally had. But Prince was hesitant, he wasn't used to being in this position. And it opened the gate, and Prince began to slowly move now his posse to the front pasture. But after just five steps, five short steps, Prince stopped. The animals knew somehow they went beyond Prince. And when the last one passed him by, Prince turned around, walked back into the pasture to the same spot I had stood shortly before, planted his feet and then locked eyes with his best friend in the most profound, intimate experience and expression of connection I have ever seen. Tears poured down my face and I walked around to the left-hand side of Prince and there we were three brothers frozen in this triangular embrace, engaged in a sacred and a solemn goodbye. Or at least that's what I thought. Because a few moments later, my beautiful, magnificent horse, Odie, steadied himself and rose up out of the water. And he took this slow right-hand turn and slowly but surely made his way out the shallow end of the pond and then made a sweeping left-hand turn and walking up to me, he lowered his head and put it right in the center of my chest and moved it back and forth just like a puppy. And I lowered my forehead till it rested in his and I held his hand and I felt the dampness in his coat and I breathed in his essence 
And then after a while, Odie pulled apart and went nose to nose with Prince in that way that only horses do. And there was a silent communication that I could hear, Odie saying to Prince, thank you, my brother. And Prince saying, not on my watch. I will never leave you. And then the two best friends moved apart and they headed to the front pasture, Odie leaning into Prince and Prince holding his beautiful friend up. And at that point, I noticed that the other animals had not yet eaten. They waited for their leader to return and knowing that all was right in the world. Now I must confess and tell you, Odie didn't live for three more months after that extraordinary miraculous day. Odie didn't live for three more weeks. My beloved Odie didn't live for three more days. Odie lived for three more years. That is the power of connection. The staff and the residents and those who have graduated from this program, they are the ones like Prince standing at the edge of the pond for the brothers and sisters who newly arrived and the ones that they go out and impact, they are the ones that make contact. They are the ones that lock eyes. They are the ones that offer not a hand out, but a hand up and journey with them to be fed in ways so that they can experience the sweet taste of mental health. Martin Luther King reminds us that connection transforms the fatigue of despair into the buoyancy of hope. Emily Dickinson famously writes that hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without words and never stops at all. I would add the connection creates hope and hope saves lives. But don't take my word for it. Ask Odie. Thank you all so much. Oh, why hello, nonprofit adventurers. Quite a tale that was. I'm glad I ran into you. We're off to meet two awesome sages of great wisdom who provide vocational training and therapeutic experience through the Farm to Mouth program. And we'll learn about the Haven House, where individuals experiencing homelessness find a supportive place to reconnect to their community. Come with me. Hi, I'm Kelly Warner, one of Yolo Community Care Continuum's board members. I have seen how daunting recovery from mental health challenges can be and know that programs like Farm to Mouth help to make recovery a reality. Farm to Mouth supports clients in their desire to participate in meaningful work within the community. The Farm to Mouth program provides a year of job skills training and employment for at least 10 people battling a major mental illness. The client workers learn basic skills such as job readiness, working with a boss, managing interactions with other employees, and having a positive work attitude. This gives clients a sense of hope and a feeling of connection to the community that they live in. From that point, they learn job-specific skills such as farming, planting, land maintenance, and harvesting techniques. These workers then master these skills and can graduate to paid positions in the Farm to Mouth program, which can lessen their dependence on disability benefits and increase their self-sufficiency. This training can even lead to employment opportunities in the surrounding farming community. This program offers an opportunity that is not currently available to people with an identified mental illness in Yolo County. The Farm to Mouth program continues to give back to, as it provides high quality food to at least 100 very low income and or homeless people within Yolo County. Why Triple C has partnered with shelters in Yolo County providing them with vegetables produced by this project. When the crops are harvested, the shelters are contacted to arrange for either delivery of the produce or pickup. The fresh produce is then incorporated into the meals that the shelters provide. By providing the shelters with fresh, nutritious produce from a locally grown source, the people served at the homeless shelter have a capacity for improved health and improved access to food. This program provides one of the final recovery pieces in the continuum, allowing clients the opportunity to live a fulfilling life within a community. Hello, my name is Anne Carroll. I've been a supporter of an ally of YCCC for over 10 years. I'm proud to support an agency that has provided hope and healing to so many. 
YCCC prides itself on providing services that the community needs. Haven House Intermediate Care Program is an example of one of these services. In August of 2018, Sutter Health, Dignity Health, and Yolo Community Care Continuum came together to address the health needs of homeless individuals in our communities. They developed a partnership that would take medically compromised individuals and give them a place to heal for up to six weeks. The guests of the Haven House program are able to recover in a place where they can stay during the day. They are provided with healthy meals to improve their nutrition and home health visits to care for their medical complications. Staff at the program work with the guests to get them connected to benefits and services in the community to help improve their overall life situation. Jeffrey had 14 emergency department visits and 12 inpatient stays in the past 18 months and was referred to Haven House due to recurring health problems. He told staff, I've not been able to deal with anything because my health is so bad. He was severely depressed and didn't know his life could be any different than living one day to the next. Staff worked with Jeffrey to break down his challenges and come up with a plan to address the daily tasks he wanted to accomplish. Once he had someone on his side to help him, he was able to work hard during his stay at Haven House to tackle the obstacles he previously believed he couldn't overcome. Jeffrey is now permanently housed and in-home supportive services help him manage his medical conditions outside of a hospital setting. He has not been in the emergency room since graduating the program. Jeffrey's sister called us to tell us how grateful she is for the help we have given to Jeffrey. She said it meant a great deal for her family to have her brother back. All of the guests at Haven House ICP will tell you that the program helps them to feel hopeful that their lives can be different. When YCCC added this program to the continuum, it provided support for the compounding health conditions that we often encountered while trying to assist people with their mental health needs. Those last two segments were so good, it was spooky. Now, introducing Casey and her friends, let's do the chicken dance. Watch my hands, they float as I disappear. Now, watch my hands do the dance. Hi, everybody, this is Casey. We're here at Safe Harbor with the amazing staff. We'd like to invite you to stand up and do the chicken dance with us. Let's get it. going to be our participants in chicken bingo today. So go ahead and put her on chicken bingo. What's up everyone? Welcome to Cool People Cribs. I'm your host, Steven, and we're gonna be checking out my crib. Welcome, welcome, welcome. As we're checking it out here, we're walking in. We got costumes all over the couch. There's no way to sit on it. It's completely useless, but it's great for when you're trying to put together a fundraising video. I got stuff all over the ground. There's my suitcase, in case I need to bring some stuff in. There's my bag, in case I'm doing that again. Got no space on the table, but uh, unicorns, definitely need a unicorn. 
It's pretty cool. Got a stick. Sticks in one of those videos. It's pretty cool. Anyhow, taking it back to Roger with top 10 conundrums. Take it away, Roger. Thanks. Wow. So 2020 has been and continues to be an unbelievable year for us all. I have here with me today one of our board members, Roger Pelkey, who has some interesting observations on what's going on this year. Roger, what is going on? Well, Michelle, you tell me and we'll both know. I have questions, 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 no answers at all. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll sum up my thoughts in the form of a list. Like a long list? How many questions do you have? A bundle. What, like five, six? Well, let's just say 10. Oh, I get it. So you've got a top 10 list like David Letterman used to do on late night TV? Okay, sure. Let's call it the top 10 conundrums of 2020. Will that work? That remains to be seen. I'm talking about real live conundrums, not to be confused with cummerbunds. Anyway, this shouldn't be too bad considering it's the first and probably the last top 10 list I'll ever do. Here we go, the top 10 conundrums of 2020. So, all of us are using Zoom for vir virtual meetings during the pandemic, right? The number 10 conundrum of 2020 is, can Zoom please add a button that plays wrap up music like that at the Oscars? You mean for like, during our board meetings? Hey, are you trying to cut me off? Never, Michelle. Okay, so as we shelter in place these days, Another question arises every morning. The number nine conundrum of, conundrum of 2020 is what time do I need to get up so I'm not late for the couch? So we all need to plan for our work week in the family room. How about the weekend? Oh, so that begs the next question. The number eight conundrum of 2020 is, um, what day is it anyway? Just don't leave the shades pulled down or you'll never figure it out. Right you are. And our furry friends are more deeply involved as well in this new normal or, or abnormal. The number seven conundrum of 2020 is what exactly do our pets know? My dog thinks I quit my job to spend more time with him. My cat thinks I got fired for being a loser. Never underestimate our pets. They're even training dogs to sniff out potential coronavirus patients. You do wonder exactly what they know. Okay, so our world is topsy-turvy in 2020. There's no better sign of that than our next question. The number six conundrum of 2020 is in 1999, they predicted flying cars by 2020. Why is it that now, in 2020, not even the planes, are, not even the planes fly? What? What about lying? It lies all over the place. What about lying to ourselves? The number five conundrum of 2020 is, will I ever be able to lie to myself again about all the stuff I would have, ha I would have done if I ever had the time? Okay, so I'm not going to lie. We don't have much more time for this nonsense. Okay, back off, Michelle, back off. We're down to number four. We need to talk about social distancing. The number four conundrum of 2020 is when can I get closer to you than the length of my CVS receipt? Hugging family and friends, that's what I'm longing for, the comeback of hugging. I think all of us are. Next up, number three, the number three conundrum of 2020 is, was that a coincidence that our last normal day was Friday the 13th? 13 guests around the table was never a good idea. Even less so now. It's a conundrum. And our lives have become so confined. As our world becomes smaller, we ask this all-important question. The top 10 conundrums of 2020. Number two is, if I promise I'll go this time, will you please invite me everywhere after this is over? Please, please. Getting out, going places, socializing, partying. Looking forward to all of that. So, what's your number one biggest conundrum of 2020? And the number one conundrum of 2020 is, you guessed it, pretty easy to guess, the number one conundrum, who will it be on November 3? YCCC encourages you all to vote early and vote often.
Uh, well, I'm okay. I'm, I'm kind of kidding, but make October your boating month. It's very important. That's all she wrote, Michelle. Ten conundrums for 2020. Confusion reigns. No answers at all. Just going down another blind alley around more blind curves. But in 2021, hindsight is 20, 2020. Better times ahead. Thank you, Roger. We at YCCC believe in the healing power of laughter. Laughter is good for mental health, even amidst our darkest days. Laughter releases bursts of dopamine, a hormone and neurotransmitter that signals pleasure and reward. The science shows that laughter can improve blood flow, immune response, and pain tolerance. We hope you all, in facing the conundrums in your life in 2020, find humor and reasons to laugh along the way. Spend some money, spend some money, come on and then spend some money. And now, folks, our feature presentation, the movie of the century. It came from the Cretaceous. Rawr, I'm here to destroy all the programs that help people and all the programs that you love. No, I won't let you do that. I still haven't learned all about the Cornerstone Project from Amber or the Harmony House Project from Avalon. I have to know about these. I'll stop you. You'll never stop me. My name is Amber Salazar, and I am the clinical director for YOLO Community Care Continuum. I'm so glad you're here. The great part about the continuum of mental health services is our commitment to being able to meet people where they are at. This short-term residential program provides psychiatric and social services in a compassionate, home-like environment. Clients get the medical and psychiatric care counseling and advocacy services necessary to stabilize their conditions. They learn to manage their illness in order to return to their homes in the community. Cornerstone serves as an alternative to and as a step down from psychiatric hospitalization. Mental illness imposes a heavy burden on individuals, families, businesses, and communities. One out of five adults will experience a mental illness this year. The onset of mental illness is devastating and typically results in a loss of dignity, significant relationships, self-esteem, and a sense of hope about the future. However, with appropriate treatment, individuals with serious mental disabilities can lead fulfilling, productive lives. Cornerstone services are unique, providing access to affordable, quality mental health care for underserved individuals. Individuals with serious health problems get treatment, mental conditions stabilize, and social needs are met. Without this resource, persons in crisis are diverted to a hospital psychiatric unit, if space is available, taken to jail, or worse, left on the street until the crisis escalates. Cornerstone provides a safe, supportive environment, access to appropriate medical and psychiatric care, counseling, and advocacy services to stabilize mental health clients. This program is designed to help each client learn to manage his or her illness and develop a plan to safely return to a less restrictive living situation. I have seen the amazing difference that this program has made in the lives of Placer County residents. Hello, my name is Avalon Hendricks. I am the Director of Quality Improvement for YOLO Community Care Continuum. When Placer County had first asked us to open up a board and care, we had said that we would open up a restorative program based on the principles of recovery and wellness. In the first year, Harmony House had served individuals who had not been successful in other board and care homes, and some who resided in locked facilities. However, in that same first year, Harmony House successfully graduated two individuals who remain independent out in the community today. Harmony House is a rehabilitative and residential setting located in Auburn, California. We serve 20 individuals who learn the necessary independent living skills while simultaneously receiving supports and services by highly trained mental health workers. This program is provided in partnership with Placer County to serve the residents of Placer County who have mental health challenges. Harmony House provides psychiatric care and rehabilitation treatment in a home-like environment. 
Clients get the medical and psychiatric care, counseling, and advocacy services needed to stabilize their conditions. They can learn to manage their illness and return to a more independent living setting in the community or reside at Harmony House. Our organization sees the possibilities for individuals with mental health challenges, not the limitations. The support provided by the Continuum allows clients to get the level of support that they need while also ensuring that they are able to achieve their hopes and dreams. We interrupt your regularly scheduled gala to share with you terrifying news. It appears that hats are appearing at random on people's heads. We're hearing now that even pets are starting to wear hats. Oh my god, it's even happened to me. Don't worry, folks, I am not going to leave you. There is nothing more important than this moment. I will talk you through this. We will get through this together. What was that? Oh, there's there's an ad segment? Oh, with, with Chris with the housing program? Well, folks, best of luck. I know you can get through this. I believe in you. Chris Musson, a YCCC board member for over 12 years. And you might be thinking, 12 years, that's a long time to be on a board of directors. And you're right, it is. But I've stayed on because I believe in the quality, community-based services the YCCC provides. The final step on the road to recovery for many people living with mental illness is often to live independently in the community of their choice. For over 40 years, YCCC has offered affordable housing opportunities in Yolo County, so that those with limited incomes and mental health challenges can live with hope and dignity in their preferred community. Services provided in the supported housing program teach clientele the independent living skills necessary to maintain a home. Skills such as developing a budget, shopping, meal planning, cooking, cleaning, and laundry. Along with these basic necessities, residents are also provided with supportive services to ensure their mental health stability and improve their quality of life. The support network assists each resident and their illness management and in keeping their individual psychiatric and medical appointments. Clients are shown how to access community resources and utilize their support networks, such as how to renew their yearly Section 8 vouchers or how to acquire their SSI benefits. They're also encouraged to participate in vocational and educational opportunities once they're able to successfully manage their symptoms. 100% of the residents served by YCCC qualify as very low income, Housing support staff meets with all program residents in weekly house meetings and on an as-needed basis to offer support and assistance in maintaining their stability within the community. Based upon these weekly meetings, individual needs are identified for each participant and the housing support employee works with the client to address their unique concerns. It is within these skill development sessions and house meetings that residents learn their coping skills, problem-solving strategies, symptom management, and acquire the mental health stability needed to live an independent lifestyle. Housing is a key element to providing hope in a continuum of health and healing. Many individuals would not have considered participation in mental health services if there wasn't the possibility of independent housing at the end of their rainbow. The housing staff and services offered by YCCC provide stability and opportunity for individuals who would otherwise find it very difficult to locate and maintain a place to call home. Ladies and gentlemen, we've done it. You've done it. You've helped out. You've been amazing. You've had fun. I've been making this up as I go. I've had fun. And now we're going to have a closing message from Michelle, thanking you all for everything you've done. I've retired to my bunker. It's a wonderful place with toilet paper and Lysol wipes. It'll last me till at least after the, the next election. So I wish you all luck. You can come try to find me, but it is an unmarked location and I'm off the grid. So thank you so much for everything you've done tonight. You've been great. Well, that's our show for tonight. I hope you had a good time. We did the best we could with what we had 
and we enjoyed being there for you. Thank you for all the donations and support that you've given us now and in the years past. We're so looking forward to next year. We're hoping to have an in-person event, and that way we can all enjoy each other's presence once again. We want to thank everyone that sponsored us this year during this difficult time, um, including the Davis Media Access, um, the Impact Foundry, and um, all the other sponsors that we had for the evening. So thank you so much, and we enjoyed being with you. And take care of yourselves, and we look forward to being with you again soon in 2021. Thank you.